evening and namaste. Let me once again uh, thank uh, Dr. Habil Korakiwala for this opportunity to spend some time with all of you and uh, just state what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be speaking to a wonderful organization of work art, as well as to have in our midst uh, Dr. Godrich and uh, Mr. Godrich. Also, uh, Utpaza, I've heard your name many times from your father, so it's very good to see you in person. Uh, and my congratulations to every member of the work art team for the tremendous uh, organization that you have built and the milestones that you've achieved. I think all of us in the healthcare arena have been through an extremely challenging and taxing time. And, you know, people say that uh, difficulty builds character. You go through these things and you become stronger and more resilient. Uh, I think all of us also realize that situations like this reveal character. Organizations that had invested in quality, that had invested in their people, that had built agility and resilience, were able to literally pivot their operations, their teams, and enable to do things that they had never dreamt they would have done before. And so, you know, I think that operational excellence is so much about taking the ideology of or the vision of your founders or your leaders and ensuring that this is practiced down to the last, uh, you know, kind of uh, microcosm within the organization. And whether that microcosm, you know, speaking from a hospital environment or a healthcare environment, which is the only, you know, kind of uh, space that I know, uh, you know, so whether it is the, the security personnel and the way he guides you or post-operatively, you know, what you see and what you hear, um, because your surgeon may have done the most outstanding surgery, but if the nurse in recovery, while you're coming out of anesthesia, is busy talking to her friend on the phone, you're not going to feel very reassured about what's happening in that environment. So this ability to transmit First, the ideology of excellence down to the smallest microcosm within the organization is my simplistic view of quality and operational excellence. And so truly, while we focus on process and technology, I believe it is strongly about the people. But the world is changing very fast. And, uh, you know, last week I was reading, uh, you know, something that, that Peter Diamond said about the impact of artificial intelligence. And it is quite clear that, you know, when he said, whether it's chatbots or process or, you know, uh, uh, voice recognition and our dependence on these, there is going to be only two types of organizations. Organizations that are highly geared to use artificial intelligence in every step and in every process, or organizations that no longer exist because they became obsolete. There are only two categories. So while the dependence on human beings and the personal touch is so critical, it is equally important for us to be able to map process, embed process, uh, use AI to ensure the replicability of the best process to enable this kind of quality. So I'm not going to go into a lot of theory on these things because I believe that all of you understand and know the theories and sometimes the best way to really share, um, you know, true value is in sharing experiences. So I'm just going to take a few of the experiences that I believe have been transformational within the Apollo organization. But before that, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of commonality between both our companies in that we are both, um, you know, founded by visionary chairmen who came in and said, let me start and create something. So my dad came back from uh, the US and uh, started uh, a cardiology practice. He used to work in Mass General. He started a cardiology practice. He set up what was then the best clinic. Uh, he used to, you know, treat people. He did the first uh, treadmill test ever in India, was in his small clinic. Uh, he set up an ICU and he saved a young man from his heart attack. But at that time, there was no credible heart surgery program in the country. The success rate for heart surgeries in the 70s uh, in Indian 
cardiac program, so it was about 70%, while the global best, uh, best practice was upward of 90% success and survival rate. So he used to refer his patients to the uh, US, this young man, 39 years of age, got a second heart attack and succumbed before he had time to raise his money and get his visa to go to the US. That day, uh, Tad said that we Indians deserve the best of healthcare. Indian doctors are delivering this care all over the world. We just need to give them the infrastructure to do so in our own country. And that was the birth of Apollo. So four years and hundreds of trips to Delhi, abroad and everywhere later, he opened a 150 bed hospital, which is, you know, Apollo Madras in those days, Apollo Chennai today. But it was structured and designed like a super speciality hospital. We had a US based administrator. Um, I was, you know, still in college and we saw this happening and we knew that it was a certain energy and passion that he brought to the table. And even then, he brought the materials manager of TVS, a car automobile uh, environment, their materials manager. And he said, if you think that a car factory has complexity, come in and see a hospital. We have seven times the number of material items and the criticality of them. If you're delayed in a car park, maybe your car won't go out for a day. If you delay a material in a hospital, somebody's going to lose a life. That man signed up. He brought in a human resource person from one of the largest uh, you know, Chennai-based companies at that time. We had a US-based CEO. And the reason I'm sharing this, and then we had Mr. Charco, who was actually the CEO of Spencer's, who became our CEO. And Spencer's was a hotel chain at that time, which Taj took over later. Because he said hospitality, combined with operational excellence, with materials management, with human resources, will support our doctors in delivering the best care. But as all of us as quality people and people pursuing excellence know, that excellence used to be measured in those early days by infrastructure standards. Does the factory have you know, a certain uh, space? Does it have windows? Does it have this much lumen lighting? And then the measurement of quality moved to process standards. Have you trained your staff? Do you have fire drills, uh, et cetera? And then quality really became what we are hearing today or what we're all practicing today is outcome-based. Because what is your throughput? What do you produce? What's your defect rate? Or how many patients can you deliver within a certain period of time? And what is the NPS score of those patients or those customers? And the reason I'm telling you, I'm coming back to my story, is that in the first year of Apollo Madras, with a heart surgeon who was operating in another hospital in Chennai, because of these processes and this leadership and this reorganization, the success rate of cardiac surgery moved from 76% that he was operating at, Dr. Girinath was operating then, to 93%. And when he presented at the cardiology conference, nobody believed him. And then the next year, he went and presented that my success rate is now 98%. And then he went on to 99.3%. He has done the largest number of individual heart surgeries in the world with a success rate of above 99%. And the rest, as they say, is history because Dr. Girinath not only has done this himself, uh, when he finished his 25,000 heart surgeries, we congratulated him on his number and his success rate. And we also analyzed that he was most proud of the fact, not that he had personally or his team had done 25,000 surgeries, but that he had trained people. And of the 120 credible heart surgery programs in the country, 94 of them had people that had been trained in Apollo. And that is because replicability, process focus, quality, and therefore excellence were operational excellence were really what we had embedded into our ecosystem. So it was a replicable model that we could train and send people out. So uh, I think it is this, this core philosophy 
of finding ways to do things well and then doing it in an environment that is scalable and replicable and repeatable is really what uh, you know we we focus on but i think operational excellence is now taking a much broader view it's also looking at competitive uh, capability it's your your input cost it's your uh, just in time inventory it's your and your ability to drive overall value to the customers and it's not so much about macro outcomes but also about micro inputs and that's where uh, the technology driven companies like the googles and the amazons of the world are transforming the way we have to keep looking at healthcare but also the interesting thing is that operational excellence is like a video game you achieve one level of success and you are super happy when you get there but the next challenge is going to come and the next challenge is going to come and it's going to get tougher and tougher and you want to keep moving so the crux of excellence and operational excellence in our mind and what the apollo team is to always stay in the game keep working at it because while perfection may not be attainable if we're chasing perfection then we will catch excellence so that's that's very very simplistically what we're trying to do but moving on i want to share a few more uh, stories one is related to to covid and about the the power to use technology interestingly as you all know one of the biggest demands on our ecosystem uh, was really to serve differently so we created what we called in an integrated manner a project called project coverage so we converted uh, over our 10000 beds we converted 6000 beds to covid oriented beds so the isolation the protocol the ability to monitor them and to minimize the number of times the nurse or the doctor had to go into the room so remote monitoring using telemedicine that we had you know been working on for 20 years all those came into capability and if we didn't get enough devices we just propped a mobile phone up there but we connected and that was one of the big things so we had the beds we scaled on the supply in the pharmacy so we over i think that time we had about 4200 pharmacies of those pharmacies 3800 pharmacies continued to work 24 by 7 with the supply chain working so the back end of getting police permissions moving inventory getting stock all these are um, you know the core foundation of operational excellence which cannot be created overnight they have to have a solid background only then they can pivot but beyond that we realized that this deluge kept coming so we tied up with hotels and we converted 6000 hotel rooms into what we call stay i stay isolated because by then we had figured out that you know a lot of it and many indian homes are not capable of keeping a family member isolated it's five people and one toilet how do you isolate someone who's got covid so we created these facilities at different tiers or your rooms at the lower end three star and five star hotels at the higher end but again with the technology connectivity so one nurse and one doctor posted there could handle almost 200 rooms because many of these patients were not sick we were just monitoring them allowing them to stay and if they became little critical then we moved them so stay i was another piece our app 24/7 got launched literally 2 months i think february 5th the dad's birthday we launched uh, 24/7 and march 20th was when covid was announced so it was it just came in so handy because we had our doctors online and video consults then just got enabled in a period of 30 days for almost 3800 doctors so they were able to stay in touch with their patients besides that we did multiple things i mean we used gapio which is the global association of physicians of indian origin to give us the latest global inputs on treatment protocol collated that into what we call the red book and the red book was our operational bible for all these 16000 beds that we were managing and then we shared it with over 400 and odd i don't remember the number uh, of nursing homes who also wanted to share the same protocol so things like this of the ability to use global knowledge consolidate it into easy to read documentation and then use technology to share it 
and then be available. Uh, so we had lecture series, we had uh, on-call doctors to share uh, and help. So um, I, I do. So coverage became a multi-dimensional approach to treatment and care. Uh, using every single one of the capabilities that we had within the company. And that's why I began by saying that, you know, uh, crises don't build character, they reveal your character. And the core of that character is that um, dad told us something very simple one day when he was walking um, out of the hospital, he has this habit of stopping by emergency. And uh, he heard a doctor say, I don't have any beds in ICU. I will help you find another hospital to go to. And he said, imagine if he told that doctor, imagine if someone had said this to your mother, how would you feel that Apollo is refusing to take care of me when I came seeking that care? So the core philosophy he gives us is do not deny a patient care, find a way discharge a, more, a less critical patient, move them into an inpatient ward, free up an ICU bed, take care of them till then, uh, find a partner nursing home. You know, many, many things we have done driven by this need to serve the community with anything that they ask us for. So moving away from COVID, I think the core is really of um, understanding that the nature of the customer has changed as well. So this demanding customer is translating into reduction of, uh, of uh, touch points, self-help kiosks, online apps, uh, delivery of medicines at home. And, and that's 24 seven, you can do a consult, call a phlebotomist home, get the result into us, uh, have your medicine delivered within half an hour after that. So all these are disparate companies and disparate systems that we have to tie together to create the seamless continuum of care and capability to treat our patient. Uh, so I was going to tell you about one of the new systems that I'm really uh, you know, quite excited about. Uh, and this came out of our diagnostic team because there was so much pressure on this team during COVID. So we created a phlebotomy team, which you know, had started with about 60 or 70 phlebotomists, but we now have um, you know, an upward, I, I, this thing, the, the number of phlebotomists, but we uh, used to have about 4,000 to 8,500 tests per day. And the average productivity of the phlebos was about 40%. We put in what is called dynamic rostrum. Uh, the IT guy who helped build that used to work at Swiggy. So we brought in that capability and technology. And so all our phlebotomists have this geography-based, pin code-based, uh, pointer. And using that, our productivity now moved up. So today from the 4,000 to 8,500, the team is collecting upward of 10,000 samples per day with the same number of phlebotomists. Productivity has moved. So I think operational excellence is primarily measured in your customer NPS. And we have been you know, upwards of 4.5 on Google ratings high NPS, but it's also measured in your ability, like I said earlier, to have high productivity and low input costs uh, so that your overall offering to your customers stays relevant all the time. I want to end by talking about, uh, you know, like I said, companies like ours that have been around, we're going into our 40th anniversary year. So you have legacy systems, legacy people, legacy operations. The power and the strength of that is there is a core passion. Many of our people have been with us for 30 years. And so they have that love for Apollo, that commitment. But shaking off legacy habits and finding ways to say we have to transform, we have to use more IT, we have to unleash this capability of operational scale. Uh, if we tell one of our, five years ago, if we told one of our CEOs, you know, purchase is a central function, he would say, why don't you trust me? I know I'm doing very good purchase. Now, 80% of all our purchases are through the, uh, the GPO, the group uh, negotiation, and uh, we're going to make it 94% through the GPO. So things like this is that we need to find the human element, but embed the operational element, shake off legacy habits, uh, do pilots carefully, create that holistic focus so they understand the broader picture. We're changing our material management, not because we don't trust you, 
but because if we get a 3% efficiency, then we can you know, uh, look at passing that on to the customer or investing that in new technology. And um, you know, quick wins to establish momentum in change, building technical systems, ensuring that your teams, the attitude, the leadership are all aligned. All these are things that all of you, you know, probably know. But I think the most powerful change leader uh, is really the leader at the top, number one, but the leader who's able to carry the whole team together and showcase small successful pilots. Uh, so when you know we implemented a, a movement activity based automated little tag for our wheelchair boys, and that changed the way uh, we brought productivity. And so we didn't have to tell them, look, we know you're sitting behind that door, you know, uh, drinking coffee or on your mobile phone. We made them feel the call from the customer and drive to that. I want to serve because the customer is waiting for me. So when you change the onus, then you're not tracking them for productivity, you're inspiring them to serve. And I think at the end of all operational excellence, uh, you can do the supervision, you can do the technology, you can do everything, but it's primarily about inspiration and leadership. So um, thank you for this opportunity to share some of these thoughts and I'm, I'm very happy to answer uh, any question.